Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our lunchtime event with Dr. Catherine Ramirez of the Latin American and Latino Studies Department and Dr. Kate Jones of the History Department here at UC Santa Cruz. My name is Silvana Falcon, and I am the director of the Research Center for the Americas and an associate professor of Latin American and Latino studies at UC Santa Cruz. I hope you enjoyed the Andean flute music in the beginning of our program, a beautiful and comforting sound. As we begin, I would like to share a few details about the event today. We are using a webinar tool, so there's no chat function. The speakers will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of their talks. And we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time, and they will be queued up for our speakers. Closed captioning is available for this talk. To enable this on your device, simply click the CC box and select show transcript. Today's event will also be recorded. The RCA is also proud to partner with Bookshop Santa Cruz on one more event this quarter. This event is a conversation with myself and author Julia Alvarez. Julia Alvarez left the Dominican Republic for the United States in 1960 at the age of 10. She is an award-winning author of six novels, three books of nonfiction, three collections of poetry, and 11 books for children and young adults. The National Endowment for the Arts selected her book in the time of the butterflies with over 1 million copies in print for its national big, big read program. We will be discussing her most recent book called Afterlife, and you can see information there in the chat. Today's event is co-sponsored with the Institute for Social Transformation and the Humanities Institute at UC Santa Cruz. We want to thank them for their support for this event and for our entire year, uh, academic year of programming. We also want to thank the Special Events Office at University Relations for their technical and logistical support. We also want to acknowledge and appreciate the UASL interpreters who are our partners in making this event accessible and inclusive. This year, the RCA's thematic focus has been on memory studies in the Americas. Memory is a form of nostalgia that can be powerful, evoke resentment, mixed feelings, or pride with particular symbols of those memories, like the missions and, monu and Confederate monuments our panelists will be discussing today. We welcome you for joining us in this dialogue to understand this contested and complicated terrain of US memory as we consider the deep racial reckoning happening in this country. Again, thank you for being with us this afternoon. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rebecca Hernandez, Director of the American Indian Resource Center at UC Santa Cruz, who is the events discussant and will be doing the formal introductions of our speakers. Dr. Hernandez's work is focused on the retention of Native students and developing programs that promote a better understanding of American Indian cultures and life ways at the university. She has worked in higher education for the past 15 years. Her academic ex expertise is in American studies, 
with a concentration in Native American studies. Thank you, Rebecca, Dr. Hernandez, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. The format of the event will be that each speaker will give their presentation first, and then I'll provide some of my initial thoughts about the work and then facilitate the audience Q&A. As a reminder, we invite you to submit your questions in the Q&A box at any time, and they will be queued up for our speakers. Our first speaker today is Dr. Catherine Ramirez, Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies. Professor Ramirez is a scholar of migration, citizenship, race, and gender, Mexican American history, Latinx literature and visual culture, comparative ethnic studies, and speculative fiction. She is the author of Assimilation, an Alternative History, and The Woman in the Zoot Suit, Gender, Nationalism, and the Cultural Politics of Memory. And she is a co-editor of Precarity and Belonging, Labor, Migration, and Non-Citizenship. She has also written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, and Public Books. Professor Ramirez has also been awarded fellowships from the Center for Advanced Studies and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University and the Ford Foundation. She is also the former director of RCA. The title of her presentation is The Other Southland, Missions, Monuments, and Memory in Tovankar. Join me in welcoming Dr. Ramirez. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez, for that introduction. I am going to share my screen. Okay, I hope, I hope you all can see my title sl slide. I hope it looks okay. Uh, those of you who aren't from there may not be aware that uh, Southern California is also known as the Southland, notwithstanding the historical, political, demographic, and cultural differences between the South and greater LA, both are sites of struggle over how or whether to remember white supremacy and the peoples subjected to it. Both are also sites of settler colonialism and indigenous dispossession and survival. I was born and raised in the San Gabriel Valley, home to Mission San Gabriel, the fourth of California's 21 missions. This mission was founded by Junipero Serra in 1771, also known as Tovangar, the LA Basin, of which the San Gabriel Valley is part, is the ancestral and enduring home of the Tongva, the native people the Spaniards called Gabrieleños. Today, LA County has the largest indigenous population of any urban area in the US, and the majority of the San Gabriel Valley's 1.4 million residents are Latinx and Asian. Masses at Mission San Gabriel are offered in English, Spanish and Vietnamese. As a child, I attended masses in honor of the Virgin Mary at the mission. My family called these masses ofrecering, which is Spanglish for offering. Ofrecering was a special occasion that mandated special attire. Dressed like miniature brides and grooms, we children paraded up the chapel's center aisle bearing flowers for the Virgin Mary. I also attended high school at the mission. My school student body was all female and almost entirely of Mexican origin. Our school's mascot was the pioneer. And growing up in California, I learned in school that there were three peoples who'd inhabited my state. The Indians who I was told had vanished many years ago, the Spanish explorers, padres, and soldiers, who I presumed had also gone away, and the white, sometimes called Anglo pioneers, who'd stayed and given us the present that we inhabited. And it's unclear if my high school's pioneer, 
is Spanish or Anglo. Regardless, the true founders of modern California, I was taught, were white. And where, if at all, people of Mexican origin fit into the master narrative of California history was unclear. For generations, the mission project has been a hallmark of California's fourth grade curriculum. In this photo from around 1979, I'm building a model of Carmel, the mission Sarah founded in 1797. With its tall, thick walls and high, narrow windows, Mission San Gabriel, the site of multiple uprisings by Native Americans, has the air of a fortress. Carmel, in contrast, is the picture of California's Spanish fantasy. Its lush courtyard and blue tile fountain belie its role in the enslavement, starvation, torture, and decimation of the Ohlone and Esalen peoples. The Spanish fantasy, a conceit identified and named by Carrie McWilliams in 1946, is a fictionalized past exploited by LA boosters bent on transforming Southern California into the cultural and economic capital of the West. In that fantasy, the Indians happily served genteel dons and pretty senoritas, and there were no Mexicans. Poet Caroline Randall Williams reminds us that the South's prosperity and sense of romance and nostalgia were built upon the grievous exploitation of Black life. Likewise, the Spanish fantasy obscures and distorts the violence of indigenous and Mexican dispossession in California. The Spanish fantasy permeates Southern California's very geography. This is the Gateway Plaza Monument in Alhambra, a city on the western edge of the San Gabriel Valley where I spent much of my youth. The Gateway Plaza Monument resembles the 11th century Puerta de Elvira in Granada, Spain. It also appears in Alhambra's city logo. Alhambra High School's mascot is the Moor. I learned to swim at the public pool at Granada Park, and I attended quinceañeras, wedding receptions, memorial services, and concerts at Almanzar Park, a park named after the storied 10th century ruler of Islamic Iberia. So in addition to erasing native Californians, the Spanish fantasy erases Mexicans. It replaces both groups with exotic and distant Moors or sanitized and proximate vis-a-vis -vis other Europeans, Spaniards. It should come as no surprise that some Mexican Americans have tried to insert Mexicans into the Spanish fantasy as a means of claiming a part of California's past. In the 1960s and 70s, accommodationist Mexican Americans believed that accepting the mission myth forged ties to white privilege to further solidify the ties between 18th century Spanish colonizers and 21st century Latinos, Pope Francis declared Sara special patron of the Hispanic people and one of the founding fathers of the US when he canonized the Franciscan missionary in 2015. Once again, the, settler, the pioneer, a settler colonial, in other words, is cast as the true American. When displaced by the white pioneer, Mexicans are victims of settler colonialism. When we become the pioneer, we are agents of it. Sarah's canonization and the reckoning over monuments that the Black Lives Matter movement has compelled have brought renewed scrutiny to the missionary and his likeness. On June 20th of 2020, the day that indigenous activists felled a statue of Sarah in downtown LA, I happened to take my parents and kids to Mission San Gabriel. The mission was closed, but I was able to take this photo in front of it. Shortly thereafter, mission authorities moved the Sarah statue pictured here to an interior courtyard away from public view. Then in the pre-dawn hours of July 11th, 2020, a fire erupted at the mission. The fire damaged much of the chapel's interior and destroyed its roof. And just over a week ago, the LA County District Attorney charged a man with arson and other counts. No motive for the fire has been given. When I first heard about the fire, I thought I felt ambivalent about it. When I saw over the summer of 2020, how protesters in Richmond, Virginia had transformed the late 19th century bronze Robert E. Lee 
monument, I felt a wrong had been righted, even if only for a moment. Then I admitted to myself that irrespective of the cause of the fire at the mission, I felt more sadness and loss than ambivalence about it. Undeniably, Mission San Gabriel testifies to the past and present of settler colonialism and indigenous dispossession. So too do Alhambra's Gateway Plaza Monument, the Statue of Liberty, and the post-World War II tract home in which I grew up. Like my family's house and the Statue of Liberty, Mission San Gabriel also testifies to histories of migration and settlement, including migration and settlement by people who aren't white or of European origin. And like my family's house and the Statue of Liberty, the mission holds memories and meaning for many. Above all, Tongva labor, artistry, and survival are manifest at Mission San Gabriel. As my colleague, Eve Chavez, has pointed out, my Tongva ancestors lived and died at Mission San Gabriel. A visitor unfamiliar with the true history of the missions may not recognize the native labor that made this church and other buildings. These structures are not just about Spanish colonization. They also reflect the accommodations that native peoples made under very difficult circumstances. Professor Chavez has identified mission museums in particular as troves of quote, archival materials made by our ancestors, unquote. She's called for increased access to those collections for native scholars. The fire at Mission San Gabriel damaged not only a place of worship of baptisms, quinceañeras, weddings, funerals, and ofreceding, but a living connection to the Tongva past as well. If as the folks at Monument Lab remind us, a monument is a statement of power and presence in public, then the missions were and are monuments. This is why the Spaniards forced native Californians to build them, accommodation as Mexican Americans have embraced them and protesters target them. Yet Professor Chavez is called to indigenize mission narratives underscores the need to rethink missions and monuments. Like lots of people of Mexican origin, I'm of indigenous North American and Iberian descent. While I'm a beneficiary of settler colonialism and indigenous dispossession, I speak to you from my office at UC Santa Cruz, unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe, I reject monuments of Sarah and other colonizers, such as Juan de Oñate and Christopher Columbus. These men, problematic in their own time and today, aren't my heroes, inviting or compelling me, other Latinos, and immigrants to identify with and to celebrate them lays bare the violence of assimilation and settler colonial erasure. Rather than reproduce that violence, I seek new ways of remembering and new relationships among past, present, and future. With the Sleepy Lagoon Memorial, the LA artists Sandra de la Losa and Arturo Romo offer a new way to link past, present, and future. Funding for this memorial hasn't yet been secured, so it's unclear if it will ever be built. Still, the time is nigh for a new kind of monument because we are, as journalist Michael Denzel Smith reminds us, Americans through force, choice, or happenstance, we need monuments that confront the complex and contradictory roles we play as displacers and displaced, as agents and victims of white supremacy and settler colonialism, including immigration as a form of settler colonialism. We need monuments that grapple with what Cherokee scholar May Lee Blackwell calls layers of coloniality, such as Spanish, Mexican, and US colonialities. We need monuments that rethink power and presence, including indigenous presence. And we need monuments that allow us to heal without forgetting. So a little bit about the Sleepy Lagoon incident. The Sleepy Lagoon incident took place in the early morning hours of August 2nd, 1942, about eight miles Southeast of downtown LA. It involved a brawl at, a, at Sleepy Lagoon, a quarry pit that doubled as a swimming hole, and a second fight at a party at nearby Williams Ranch. Jose Diaz attended that party, and after the 22-year-old's body was found outside the host's house, police rounded up hundreds of Mexican-American youths as suspects in his murder. Teachers, cops, academics, social workers, 
the mainstream Angelino press and the judge and district attorney in the Sleepy Lagoon case branded Mexican American youths gang members. The zoot look, a style of dress popular among not only some participants in the Sleepy Lagoon incident, but among young working class American youths in general, was declared the uniform of the Mexican American delinquent. Less than a year after the Sleepy Lagoon incident, the Zoot Suit riots erupted in LA. And during the riots, white servicemen attacked Mexican American Zooters and people of color in general, irrespective of their attire. The police did nothing or they arrested the servicemen's victims. The Sleepy Lagoon incident and its aftermath exemplify state sanctioned violence against people of color. In these events, we see elements of the racial and carceral state, such as racial profiling, stop and frisk, and the gang injunction. Both the Sleepy Lagoon incident and Zoot Suit Riots loom large in Chicanx cultural production. However, there are no public markers commemorating them. The Sleepy Lagoon Memorial would draw attention to them without honoring a single event or exalting a particular individual. Spanning 150 yards in Riverfront Park in the city of Maywood, the memorial would consist of multiple parts, including a path, a swale containing native plants, works of art, such as sculptures and designs on the ground, and seated elements. In homage to the Tongva and current indigenous diasporic communities, seats in the form of tree trunks would be modeled after trees native to one of the many cultures that have inhabited Southeast LA. For example, some would look like the California oak and the ceiba of Mexico and Central America. Similarly, signage would be in English, Spanish, Tongva, Nahuatl, and Mayan. In addition to remedying historical erasure, the Sleepy Lagoon Memorial would offer ecological remediation. The area where Sleepy Lagoon used to be was once rural. Today, it's one of the most densely populated and polluted corners of LA County. Maywood Park is roughly three miles from XI Technologies, the source of one of the worst environmental and public health disasters in California and a textbook example of environmental racism. From 1922 until its closure in 2014, the smelter and battery recycling plant at XI spewed lead, arsenic, and other toxins into the primarily Latinx and working class communities surrounding it. Intertwining past, present, and future and the social and ecological, the Sleepy Lagoon Memorial reckons with the violence committed against the people, plants, and animals in and around what used to be Sleepy Lagoon. The memorial also celebrates the persistence and resilience of human and non-human life. Parts of the memorial resemble traditional monuments. For example, the bas-relief mural on the back of the whispering wall and bench features images of zooters. Meanwhile, the swale that the bench overlooks evokes Sleepy Lagoon, the gravel pit that Mexican-American youths transformed into a swimming hole because they were often denied access to segregated public pools. The native plants filling the swale were selected not only in honor of displaced ecologies, but also because they help with stormwater filtration and soil remediation. Like the missions and statues of Sarah, the Sleepy Lagoon Memorial would be a statement of power and presence in public. Yet rather than projecting white supremacy and inspiring terror, this memorial sets out to heal historical, social, and physical wounds. It remedies the omission of Latinos from dominant narratives of Angelino history while acknowledging LA's past and present indigenous peoples. It reminds us of the ongoing need to address profound social pro problems, such as police brutality and contests over space between poor racialized communities and more powerful forces. And it beckons all of us to pay attention to the health of our planet. Where traditional monuments like those of Junipero Serra and Robert E. Lee are objects. The Sleepy Lagoon Memorial is an ecosystem, an alternative to those of El Camino Real, the Spanish fantasy, and toxic capitalism. With its path and seats, the memorial brings together motion and stillness. The path is an invitation to enter and move through the memorial, 
while the seats are an invitation to stay. That the whispering wall, the memorial's most monumental component, doubles as a bench is significant. A bench gives us the opportunity to be still, in addition to transferring the cultural and environmental knowledge and history of the area, the Sleepy Lagoon Memorial seeks to provide space for reflection and regeneration for Tovangar's present and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez, for your presentation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Jones, Associate Professor of History. Dr. Jones's first book is called Intimate Reconstructions, Children in Post-Emancipation Virginia, and was published with the University of Virginia Press in 2015. The book won the Grace Abbott Book Prize from the Society for the History of Children and Youth in 2016. She is currently at work on a book about the history of child incarceration in the post-Civil War era. She has published articles in the Journal of Southern History, J19, and the Journal of the Civil War Era. The title of her presentation is Monuments, Memory, and Repair, Stories from Virginia. Join me in welcoming Dr. Jones. All right, thank you so much for that, Rebecca. And um, thanks, thanks to all who've made this possible. I'm gonna also share my screen and um, run some slides. Okay, so like Kat, I'm also from a Southland, um, but the Eastern one, the one whose coherence as a region coalesced in the 19th century around white people's commitment to slavery as a labor system, a property regime, and a source of oligarchic power. That commitment led many of its residents to pursue the treasonous vision of the Confederacy, which was defined by an unflinching commitment to making white supremacy the guiding principle of their would-be nation. Despite its very real military defeat, the Confederacy has dominated the memorial landscape of the American South for over a century and a half. The creators of Confederate monuments built them in order to tell stories about the past that in turn enabled them to claim power in their present moment. As part of the Lost Cause movement, which pushed Confederate treason and devotion to slavery to the margins of Civil War history, Confederate monuments softened the past into a, soothing, a source of soothing nostalgia for many white Southerners. But make no mistake, such monuments did real harm, not least by bolstering reactionary political movements that challenged state action white people saw as serving the interests of others. Interests they saw as um, inherently illegitimate. Indeed, the failed Confederate state helped generate an ideological and symbolic vocabulary that has served those committed to protecting white power and privilege in places far removed from the American South, including here in California. And I'm just showing a slide of a map put together by the Southern Poverty Law Center illustrating the wide distribution of Confederate memorials, including in uh, California itself. And this is one that was erected as recently as 2004 and removed in 2019 in Orange County. So monuments and the narratives they perpetuate, however, do not stay under the control of their producers forever. In the past five years, we've witnessed a dramatic transformation in popular understandings of the stories Confederate monuments tell. Although the conflicts are far from over, the number of people claiming that Confederate monuments are merely elegiac memorials to men who died in pursuit of a noble, if quixotic political project is dwindling. Generation of works by activists and historians have made it abundantly clear that these monuments were part of robust efforts to suppress black political and civil rights, first in the undoing of reconstruction in the late 19th century, and again in the mid 20th century resistance to the civil rights movement. And I'm showing one more slide from the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is really here to illustrate the, the timing of these memorials, that they really um, are put up in large numbers in the early 20th century, coinciding with the rise of Jim Crow. And you can see another little bump there in the middle of the 20th century, uh, coinciding with the civil rights movement. So in preparing for this talk, I've been thinking about how I learned about monuments and history as a white child growing up in the American South, as well as what I've learned as a historian of Reconstruction. 
both the threads of experience lead me to believe that we are in a consequential moment of reckoning, but one that began long ago. Further, they convince me that acknowledging the violent past that many monuments obscure is the beginning rather than the end of vital civic work. If we focus only on correcting the lies monuments help propagate, we miss a key dimension of their distorting power. Monuments are as much about what they silence as what they say. And Confederate monuments have obscured the role Black Southerners played in abolishing slavery and liberating themselves. They have kept the stories of how Black Southerners radically remodeled American democracy in the aftermath of the Civil War at the margins of popular consciousness. Therefore, taking down monuments is only one step in a larger process of repair that might lead to what Free Agunfami Bangura, a scholar and activist from Richmond, Virginia, calls commemorative justice. Her term reflects the insights of a decades long global struggle over the memorialization of Atlantic slavery that has emphasized the links between memory, reconciliation, and reparations. Advancing commemorative justice means that removal is not an end in itself, nor can consensus be the standard for deciding what comes next. As communities struggle over these questions, they have an opportunity to engage in the work of historical recuperation that expands community knowledge of the past through inclusive and critical historical research. And this work is vital because the idea that the past can speak for itself is as inadequate as it is seductive. So for me, growing up in Virginia marked my sense of the ways the past intrudes into the present, which is to say aggressively and inconsistently. Virginia is a place enthralled with its past, but in the words of Ralph Ellison, notoriously selective in the exercise of historical memory. I went to elementary school in Lynchburg, Virginia in the 1980s, home of Jerry Falwell and Liberty University, but also the home of Ann Spencer, the poet and civil rights leader, and Virginia University, a black Baptist college founded in 1886, the same year Democrats swept back into power in the state and began building the legal edifice of Jim Crow segregation in earnest. As far as I could tell as an elementary school student, history seemed to be largely confined to the 18th century. At school, we dressed up in mop caps and aprons to play colonists, imagining the past as a tidy world defined by quaint houses and habits rather than violence and exploitation. Native people seemed to exist only in the Thanksgiving story, even though the seat of the Monacan Indian nation was less than 20 miles away. During elementary school, I remember visits to Poplar Forest a peculiar octagonal house known as Thomas Jefferson's retreat outside Lynchburg. While Jefferson made only flitting visits to the house, the nearly 200 enslaved people who lived and worked there received only a passing mention during their tours. Instead, I recall a costume reenactment of Thomas Jefferson bravely eating a tomato to prove to his fellow Virginians that this member of the Nightshade family was safe. The heavy silence around slavery at Poplar Forest and other field trip sites conveyed the sense that some aspects of the past were too dangerous to discuss. So school children in Virginia got a lot of history, um, but it was predictably expurgated, shorn of suffering and violence. And I think the selectivity of the history offered to children was about more than creating an orderly and even beguiling portrait of the past. It was about confining conflict by circumscribing history in ways that obscured what Salamisha Tillett calls its ongoingness. That is, it disrupted questions about how the past informed the present, questions that were as pressing in the 1980s as they are now. Efforts to turn the past into a refuge from the present, however, are very vulnerable to disruption because curating the past is a tricky business, in part because it leaves traces all around us. And the monument that made the biggest impression on me as a child in the 1980s um, in Lynchburg was an unintentional one. In the big city park next door to my elementary school, there was a large rectangular space marked off by partially submerged walls. Filled with green grass and bordered by passion vines, it looked like a ruin. The mystery of why people would destroy a swimming pool in a place as hot and sticky as Lynchburg naturally piqued an eight-year-old's curiosity. And the answers I got 
brief and elliptical though they were, fueled my sense that there were connections among the parts of the past that stayed quiet in my world. This is an image of it in its glory days. The story of the pool's closure was part of the ongoingness of slavery. The system of segregation that white Southerners developed beneath the shelter of the lost cause myth had enabled whites to harness public money to create goods accessible only to them. When black activists demanded the desegregation of Lynchburg's public pools in 1961, the city responded by closing them down and filling this one with dirt. And Lynchburg was not alone in its response. Cities across the country defunded public pools in the following decade, giving rise to a new form of segregation achieved through the abandonment of public institutions and the rise of effectively segregated private ones. As Heather McGee has recently argued, these episodes vividly illustrate the high costs that false understandings of the past impose on everyone, even those who believe themselves well served by the status quo. These episodes also left physical remains that can serve as memorials to a deep and ongoing record of harm, as well as resistance to it. A year after Lynchburg public closed the public pools, it launched a new effort to fight, to fight school integration through the courts. When that effort failed, some white citizens applied the strategy of privatization to resisting school integration by establishing white academies, like Jerry Falwell's Liberty Christian Academy. Consequently, when I started school at Garland Rhodes Elementary in 1980, it was integrated, but only recently so. Although black students had individually applied to transfer to the previously all white school since 1962, it was only in 1977 when the city embarked on a school consolidation plan to merge formerly segregated schools that the school became fully integrated. That year, Vivian Cam, a black educator who helped shepherd the city's long process of integration became principal of Garland Roads, a school named for two Confederate generals from Lynchburg. As part of her work in trying to make integration yield the equity it promised, Principal Cam also took steps toward commemorative justice. In her first year as principal, she removed the two commanding portraits of the generals that hung in the main hall. She later explained, quote, I thought about asking the parents or the other teachers, she said, but finally one day I just decided to do it. I took the paintings down and I put them in a closet and I put up some other pictures of children playing together, black and white children. Cam made the judgment that the shadow cast by that history hampered her work and the work of the school. She drew rebukes from, from some parents and the resignations of a few teachers but she helped make the school less hostile to the students who moved through its halls. Her act of repair anticipated and helped enable the transformative moment we occupy now. The act had limits, of course. The ongoingness of slavery's legacies took other forms. As children in a public school that still practiced corporal punishment, we couldn't miss the fact that Ms. Duggar only seemed to break out big red and old yeller as she christened her yardsticks when she thought black kids were misbehaving. Nevertheless, Cam's action was a meaningful step toward refusing to let a distorted past derail work aimed at producing a different future. So in 2016, I returned to Virginia and I spent most of the year in Richmond doing archival research for a new book. My bus ride to the state archive took me by the towering monuments of the Confederacy that dominate parts of the city. In the archive, I read about penitentiary inmates mostly black and many formerly enslaved, compelled to help build the monument to Robert E. Lee, the first in what became Richmond's notorious Monument Avenue. Those monuments erected um, in large part to promote investment in a racially segregated, um, racially covenanted neighborhood on what was the edge of the city seemed immovable in 2016. But in different parts of the city, Activists were bringing other stories into view. Groups like the Defenders for Freedom, Justice and Equality had spent decades demanding the preservation and interpretation of sites in Shaco Bottom, the neighborhood that had been the heart of Richmond's slave trading district and home to the African burial ground. As part of a wave of heritage tourism development, the city finally commissioned the Richmond Slave Trail in the 1990s and added, 
but the slides are slowing down. Um, so you can see the slave trail here. And they added the Reconciliation Triangle Monument in 2007. In order to follow the trail, a visitor has to pick their way under the overpasses and over the train tracks. You can see here how it's cut off um, from the city by the highway and the train tracks. If they do so, however, they will find memorials in the form of makeshift altars and names of enslaved people pinned to trees. The spaces around the African burial ground are defined by absence more than monumentality. But in addition to maintaining quiet meditative spaces, activists have organized celebrations. In 2018, Untold RVA, Free Egunfami Bangura's organization established Gabriel Week to commemorate a liberationist uprising organized in Richmond in 1800 by Gabriel, an enslaved man. So in other words, black Richmonders have been pushing different stories of the city into view for a very long time long before events in 2020 drew international attention. When protesters gathered at the Robert E. Lee Monument in 2020 in the wake of George Floyd's murder, they were pursuing a project of repair that has been underway for years and indeed generations. At night, local artists Dustin Klein and Alex Creakey projected images of Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, but also Sandra Bland and Tamir Rice. Other occupiers erected a sign renaming the circle, beautiful Marcus David Peters Circle, liberated by the people, in honor of a man killed by Richmond police in 2018. Such actions connected the demand to change the stories we tell about the past to demands for justice in the present. The community hearings, debates, and commissions that have followed have been at turns painful and productive, frustrating and exhilarating. The question of how the monumental landscape of the city will ultimately be transformed is far from settled, but it's clear it can't go back to quietly acquiescing to the dominance of monuments to an ignominious history of exclusion and violence. It seems possible that it will yield monuments that reflect the complexity and richness of the past in ways that support the people who live in the city now. At the root of these efforts is the view that changing the memorial landscape is one step in a larger project of repair. The principles of commemorative justice demand that we begin with what Nell, with historian Nell Urban Painter calls, quote, a fully loaded accounting of the past. This entails naming the lies of white supremacist monuments, but more than that, it requires bringing the stories those lies helped obscure into view. Fighting about monuments can seem like a backward looking misdirection in the face of real suffering in the present. But if we think about it as an element of repair, it becomes clear that it anticipates a future where fuller reparations are possible. Transforming monumental landscapes is not an end in itself, though effective memorials can draw visitors into an ongoing process of rediscovery and reckoning. As communities debate what is important to remember they are asking questions premised on the fact that we who live in the present can never shed the burdens of the past. When we embrace those burdens, we may in fact be able to build a future that is both more just and more beautiful. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, back Dr. Ramirez and three of us will uh, have some conversation but i did want to remind everyone that, that um to please ask your questions in the q a that's where we're going to be pulling them from and uh, we welcome them any of them any and all uh so I, I have the privilege of of getting to you know ask the first question and talk with you about something i'm interested in knowing and that's um you know so what is remembered uh, is at the heart of your presentations today. And we know that even on a personal level, memory is skewed and that over time our memories become the means by which we find our own sense of belonging in a story. As you both have pointed out, this is true of places as well. So I'm interested in hearing more about what type of change you believe is possible around monuments, statues and sites of memory when the individual and collective understanding of self is so closely linked to them. So is it possible to have all-inclusive monument, right? I, I'm interested in knowing your thoughts on that. 
either one of you can start. Can I go ahead, Kat? I can start or, I mean, I think I loved the um, Kat's meditation on the Sleepy Lagoon Monument because I think it promises um, a kind of pluralism. I, I think one of the things that we have to let go of in terms of the older forms of monuments is this idea of their kind of singular point of view and their staticness. And I think I'm really excited by proposals for monuments that are coming from artists all over the country and all over the world that call for incorporating dynamism and change into those monuments. Um, and so there are a variety of people kind of embarking projects across the United States, some connected to the memorialization of slavery, but other events as well that are calling for a kind of ongoing process of community participation as one way to get away from that idea that monuments are about kind of controlling and producing a unitary narrative of the past. And I think the monument that Kat was pointing to um, kind of echoes and draws on some of those principles. So I'd love to hear more from her about how she's seeing that. So yeah, I, I, um, I agree with what you just said, Dr. Jones. Um, I think that we count on, on artists, not only for images, but for imagination. And I'm um, blown away by um, uh, the proposed memorials that I've seen um, in, I guess it was, when was it? It was uh, August 24th of 2020, the New York Times uh, Style Magazine ran a story called America's Monuments Reimagined for a More Just Future. And um, the story included uh, renditions of these proposed memorials by different groups like Decolonize This Place. And I think the Gorilla Girls were featured as well. And um, yeah, you know, people have gone beyond, you know, these artists are, are thinking beyond the statue of a man on a horse and um, imagining um, more dynamic um, memorials that incorporate uh, plants, for example. So the monuments um, morph, you know, they change over time and um, they um, involve more interaction, you know, between um, spectators or participants and, and the memorial itself. Um, now, regarding your question, uh, are all inclusive monuments possible? You know, probably not. And you know, I just think that that there is just so much um, heterogeneity and diversity of peoples and viewpoints um, that I don't think any one memorial will will please everyone. And that is not um, in and of itself a bad thing. And I wonder. You know, I mean, I mean, where we are in this particular moment in our history as a country, I wonder how those competing narratives are, are going to be possible in public space, right? Um, this this is what's happening in the world of museums and any kind of uh, any kind of public arena where um, it's clear that <laughs> it's clear that there has, you know, almost there's almost a necessity for one um, you know, for, in order to provide an opportunity for that silenced population to speak, there has to be, right, people have to back up, um, back up from the history that we un we've always thought we understood about ourselves as Americans, but that's painful and difficult. And, and so I think my, um, what's in my mind around all of this is how are we gonna educate Right, the citizens of the country to help to help them be able to do that without creating resentment, without feeling right, without feeling all the ways that that type of shift would make people feel um, that are not only just invested in the original narrative, but but really, um, you know, are confused by what's happening because I think confusion reigns right now in a lot of communities, right, around what has happened and what is happening and why it's happening the way it's happening. So, so these are grander questions, but I, I'm, I'm happy that you were able to answer them. We, we do have uh, several questions and I, I wanted to answer the first one um, from Shirley who asked, um, has the Catholic church admitted enslaving indigenous people and repaid them in any way for their cruel enslavement? Uh, and I, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, the answer is, 
Yes, uh, Pope Francis did apologize in 19, or I'm sorry, in 2015 on his trip to Bolivia for, um, for what the church did to indigenous people, but it was a very, uh, it was a very broad, ambiguous kind of apology, and there's never been any, um, you know, reparations or anything for that. So, so thanks for that question. And can I can I add to your response? Yes, yes please. Um, so I want to say that some churches, like the um, Episcopal Church, are considering reparations for uh, the enslavement of Africans and their um, descendants um, in the Americas. Um, but not unlike the conversation about monuments, um, the conversation about reparations. Um, it's it we don't talk about it as much in relation to um, Native Americans and the indigenous peoples of the Americas. So as far as I know, just to go back to that question um, in the chat, um, I can't see it right now, but um, there there is no there there have been no like formal reparations um, uh, for Native Americans from the Catholic Church by the Catholic Church. Um, there's been this apology. Uh, that that the Pope offered alongside Evo Mor Morales, um, the Aymara president at the time of Bolivia. Um, but yeah, as far as I know, there have been no formal reparations from the Catholic Church. Right, the Catholic Church specifically, right. Um, and I don't know, other than the Episcopals, I don't know that there is any other denomination that's conversing or having any sort of, you know, uh, reckoning with, <laughs> you know, how they used indigenous labor or took indigenous land, right, to build churches on. Um, so question for Professor Jones, uh, can you please talk about the role of the United Daughters of the Confederacy in erecting monuments? What does this tell us about intersections of gender and white supremacy and the role of white women in supremacist organizations? And that's from Amy. Yeah, thanks for that question. So certainly, I mean, the United, United Daughters of the Confederacy was an organization formed in the late 19th century, um, and its nominal purpose was to honor the history of the Confederacy, but it's also it was about gathering power for the women who participated in it. Um, and part of the way they did so was by um, cultivating this story of the kind of myth mythic and heroic lost cause. Um, and I think one of the things that's striking about the persistence of the UDC is that they kept working in the 20th century, um, sponsoring things like monuments in places like California, helping support naming highways after people like Jefferson Davis. So they were really active leading proponents of um, kind of nationalizing a pro-Confederate understanding of the, the history of the Civil War, and by extension, a kind of apology for the institution of slavery itself. And scholars of the UDC would argue that in part, there is kind of a bargain struck by women who participate um, that by kind of allowing themselves to be part of um, or embracing the cause of that veneration of the lost cause, they could gain a certain kind of public standing and public influence. Um, and, and I think there is, there's a clear, um, clear story of, of the leadership of white women in, uh, in kind of continuing this, this, this story, these false narratives. Um, and it's, it's an organization that's reckoning with its past right now and considering what it's gonna do with its buildings. It's still, still alive and still does lots of civic work. So, so I think there's, a, there's an ongoing question of what its future is really going to be. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Kristen uh, for both of you. Uh, there's a persistent criticism on the right that taking down monuments is quote unquote erasing history. Of course it's not. What gets memorialized is not the same as what happened as your wonderful presentation showed. Uh, but what message often fall, uh, but that message often falls or seems to fall on deaf ears. What do you think is the most effective way of responding to the complaint about erasing history? I, I have uh, an answer. Um, I think education is so important. And I think this is connected also to uh, the question from uh, Professor Gonzalez, Jennifer Gonzalez um, asks us to say more about the relation to, between monuments and museums. I think I lost a headphone. Hold on. Um, 
both in terms of monumentality and memory, and, and I would add schools. I think schools are such an important institution here because um, I think that we have a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of um, fear and vitriol because of ignorance, um, quite frankly. And, um, you know, I, I have a PhD in ethnic studies and, and ethnic studies is often um, cast as, as a racist um, undertaking because scholars of ethnic studies study race and power. Many of us study racism. And, um, uh, you know, just talking about racial differences and, and racism for some people is very threatening and, and tantamount to being racist. Um, and so I think that we need to have more conversations like this. Um, and I think that schools have a really important role to play. And I will say that um, in the Santa Cruz um, city schools, at least, you know, that my kids were smaller when, when they were, um, when my son was in fourth grade, my daughter didn't do fourth grade in the Santa Cruz city schools, but the, um, mission project was very different from uh, my experience of it in 1979. Good to hear. <laughs> Kate? Yeah, no, I mean, I would echo a lot of what Kat is saying. I think there is, uh, there's a role for schools. And I think there's also, I mean, it makes me think of the, the point that you raised earlier, Rebecca, about the real, um, the real conflict that emerges around these, these monuments. And, and as you say, a, a space for confusion. And I think um, kind of acknowledging that we can't just kind of pretend it's not there. But I, I guess I see this as, as an example of the way activists who have targeted these monuments, and, and I would say, I mean, these monuments, you know, in the case of the Confederate monuments, they've been sites and nodes of conflict um, since the moment they were erected. I mean, there were acts of iconoclasm, as it's called, by African-Americans in the South in the late 19th century, chipping away at some of these monuments. Um, so there's a long history here. And I think that there's, this, there's an opportunity, actually, because of those um, kind of sometimes acts of vandalism, sometimes acts of protest, to kind of compel teachers and others to take this up. I mean, I think we've seen the outpouring in the press and in other places that have now kind of undertaken the work of, of uncovering the history of these monuments. And, and I really appreciate um, Kristen's question about this story of erasing history because it's a, it's a powerful claim and people make it so quickly. And I think one of the answers to that is a fuller accounting of the history of these monuments, which, which really does mean revealing, I mean, the case of the Confederate monuments, it's really not ambiguous. I mean, what the Confederacy was about is really um, directly related in their own statements about their commitments. But that has been submerged by the form of the, the man on the horse, the monumental, unchanging, noble mean. And, and so I think part of it is, is the using these monuments as an opportunity to uncover those false stories and they really are false, um, but then making sure that that's not the end. Um, and that's where I think that proposed Sleepy Lagoon monument is so compelling in insisting that the ways we're gonna tell those stories are gonna be multiple. They might be figurative in some insta instances, representative in, in others, but sometimes it's going to be about creating a space that welcomes people to be in it, to, to reflect and think. Um, and, and I think I, I have to say, I do kind of, um, I feel for the people who are running museums confronted with saying, we'll just send all these things to museums and they'll figure it out. Um, but I think um, gallerists and, and archivists and museum directors are getting really creative about you know, saying, we're not just going to be the resting ground of these ignominious structures, but their efforts, for example, to create collections that reflect, that reveal this legacy of iconoclasm and protest. Um, so I think there are really interesting ways that um, at least some of what I'm getting glimpses of, you know, virtually in our current moment of the way museum runners are, are putting together monuments and work of contemporary artists, for example, to kind of put them in dialogue with each other in ways that I think um, invite viewers to recognize that on going conversation between the past and the present. And it's a big job, um, but I also feel like it seems like there's a lot of energy around that, a desire to think in with new tools about what that might look like. And so I'm grateful that there are artists and scholars and activists who are doing this. It's a, it's a plurality of people, and I think that's going to yield some exciting things. I agree, and I think younger museum professionals and also folks that work in public art and other areas 
are are grappling with what um, you know what it what even museum space is going to be right um, because even that's shifting and changing and it needs to in order to remain viable um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the, in the next 10 years or so with all of this um, so a question more of a psychology you know kind of a psychological question from Aaron is um, what if we just moved to remove monuments and let there be space as a monument right uh, do we have to force memory is that kind of a necessity for us as people I, I'm assuming she's asking do one of you want to answer that it's kind of a diff it's kind of an interesting question it's an interesting question. I, I, I look forward to hearing what Kat has to say. And um, I, I mean, I think, I guess I, um, I think there that's emptiness and and kind of um, openness in spaces can be powerful. I mean, that's part of what I actually found really powerful at, about visiting some of those spaces I was showing in Richmond is is the the limited amount of interpretation that's there um, kind of leaves it open for. A, uh, kind of reflection on that absence. But on, on the flip side, I guess I'm not quite willing to let go of the potential that memorials and monuments have for prompting and aiding dialogue and investigation. I mean, I think, you know, we spend more time moving around in public places than we do our, our years in classrooms. Um, and so I guess to me, it feels like um, to just to just embrace the emptiness feels like yielding too much. Um, but I'm curious what what you or Kat might have to say about that. So I when when the statue of um, the slaver Edward Colston was removed in Bristol um, in the summer of 2020, for a while there was this um, empty pedestal, and I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. Like what do we do with this space? And then at a certain point, an artist um, replaced the statue of Bristol uh, with a statue of um, um, a black woman with her uh, right arm and, and fist raised. Um, and I believe that was removed as well at a certain point. I can't recall exactly right now. Um, but I did think that, that, um, that, I, I found the empty pedestal to be very um, um, poignant and um, evocative. Um, I think maybe I, I think that there is there is value, there is meaning in, in absence at times. Um, so I do think it's worth considering. Um, I also think that we can look to to Germany um, for some of the memorials there that uh, reckon with the Holocaust. Um, and, and there are ways like the stumbling stones in the street, you know, that, that basically say that there was someone who lived in this place here who was deported. And then there's a little bit of information like the, the birth year um, and then the death year and the, um, the place of death, um, the concentration camp. And so I think that there are models that we can look to in other countries as well. So if I can add one other thing, I'll just mention that your, your, your comment, Kat, made me think there's a really interesting art, an artist named, um, her name is Ada Pinkston. She's based in Baltimore. And she's been doing performances in spaces where some of the Confederate monuments have been, have been removed and they're just the pedestals. She goes and performs and, and will do these kind of temporary live installations where she does dance and other things. So, so I think there are people who are both embracing that kind of um, the space, but also then occupying it in some really interesting ways. That's great. Uh, I want to mention uh, that someone named Amy uh, meant, uh, put in the uh, chat that there, or in the Q&A, that there is a movement among United Methodists, which is now in process of schism over LGBTQ plus rights, to return land to Native Americans, but typically not land buildings currently in use. So I'm going to put that in the chat for everybody. Uh, so if you're interested in looking at that article, um, that would be in reference to some things we talked about earlier. But um, okay, uh, let's see. 
there's a lot of, I'm going to scroll up to the top and uh, of the questions and ask uh, for Dr. Jones. Is there any analogy between large monuments like the Stone Mountain, Georgia sculpture to Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and the mountainside Buddha sculptures in Afghanistan, uh, which were dynamited and destroyed by the Taliban? That's a really interesting question, and I have to confess to feeling unprepared to answer it really in terms of understanding more about the history of those sculptures in Afghanistan. Um, but I, I guess I take the point of the question is to kind of think about, at times I'm thinking about iconoclasm in the US context where people have targeted these Confederate monuments as something um, to be embraced and something that stimulated a productive reconsideration of false representations of the past. But, but I think the question is pointing out that it's not an uncomplicated question. How do we um, determine when those actions are justified and when, um, and when they're acts of, of harm and vandalism? And I, I guess I keep returning to the questions of power and trying to understand the dynamics of power about when certain monuments were erected, the purposes they served, um, and by extension, the purposes that taking them down might serve. Um, and so I don't, I guess I don't have a kind of universal um, view of that, but I certainly, um, I mean, I think of, when I think about Stone Mountain and those large sculptures, their monumentality is, is part of their claim to power. Um, and, and so, um, so it, it just, I, in my mind, invites us to think about those questions and recognize that they might manifest and mean different things in different contexts. There is no universal, rule to follow and kind of determine and, and evaluating what actions are are right. And, and I do want to just share in response to that, that, you know, monuments are, I mean, they are like physically, right? Um, when you're in the presence of some of them, just profound, right? Like this, like, Lincoln Memorial or, um, you know, Stan I, I, I mentioned to you, Kate, that I, I visited Richmond. And when I was driving up and down Monument Avenue, just they're enormous, you know? And I mean, it's hard to get the, the um, scale from a photograph, but if you're standing next to some of those monuments, it, you know, it, it's like you have to stand really far back to even see the actual statue. That's how enormous they are. And it gives a very, I mean, it forces one to, you know, pause and think, wow, these people must have just been so incredible or so important, you know, it's, it's how it's set up in the physical as well as, you know, all that messaging, um, very important to also recognize. And we have a lot of monuments in DC that, you know, I think are, and, and uh, as mentioned, right, the Statue of Liberty, they, these are all, iconic spaces for, you know, Americans and, um, all right. So uh, Eve asked, at a visit to one of the missions years ago, I was told that natives who had been converted to Christianity were still not allowed to be buried within the walls of the mission cemetery. Is this true? So um, I, you know, I'm going to also just admit my ignorance. I, I'm not sure the missions that I have been to um, claim to hold uh, the remains of um, indigenous people of native Californians. Um, and I recently just uh, this past weekend went to the mission at San Juan Bautista because I wanted to see, I thought I could see the grave of Toy Purina, who was a Tongva woman who led an uprising at Mission San Gabriel in um, 1785. And she was exiled from the mission. She um, ended up at Carmel and eventually she um, converted to Catholicism um, and, is buried at um, San Juan Bautista. And so I, you know, I paid my admission and I went in and you have to walk through the, the church to access um, the cemetery. I was shocked by um, how small the cemetery, I mean, supposedly there are 4,000 people uh, buried there. And it's like not even, it's like the size of like, I don't know, maybe it's a little bigger than like a 25 meter pool. Um, 
And I, um, yeah, I was like, I guess the, the bodies must be buried on top of me. I don't know. I, I think there's just a, uh, um, a, there are a lot of questions about um, these graves. Yes, there are. And here in Santa Cruz, um, well, I do want to say that every mission had a different um, way of dealing with um, the, the Native people after they died, right? Some, some did allow for them to be buried in the church um, burial grounds. Most did not, and most had mass grave sites. So, um, so there that that was the case here in Santa Cruz, California. For those who are not here, um, it's it's not even near the the church itself. So, um, so it's complicated. There, there's no one answer, and right. Um, so this is a question for both Professor Ramirez and Professor Jones. Both of you discussed young people as a key target audience for memorials. Can you say a bit more about this relationship and in particular about the potential of engagement for young people with reparative monuments? So I feel like it's some kind of game of chicken about who goes first and <laughs> read your face. So sorry, Kat, um, I'll, I'll go real quickly. Um, forgive me if I'm speaking over. I, I think that's absolutely right. I, I think I, certainly when we saw at the, you know, in the 2020 protests, um, the people who are taking action in a place like Richmond, but I think all over the country, there are a lot of young people involved. And I think some of the kind of activists who are continuing, continuing to do this work in the city of Richmond are involving young people um, in the events they organize and acts of kind of pilgrimage to sites and kind of um, the acts like the, that, that tree I showed, um, brings groups of young people to that site and they engage in that work of putting up um, those names, attaching them to the tree. So there are these kinds of actions underway. But I'm really interested, I mean, I'm teaching a class right now where students are put to get, putting together memorial proposals and it's really exciting to hear the kinds of questions and ideas they're bringing to the table about what should be possible, what these kinds of spaces can do. And so um, I don't think I have the answer of what's going to happen, but I feel a lot of optimism and excitement about what young people are, are bringing to the table for this. And I'll just add very quickly that um, when I was a, a kid, my family and I traveled across the country and you know we visited uh, Monticello and um, we visited a slave plantation, I think in Louisiana. Um, and I remember asking about um, the, the slaves, I, we, these uh, buildings were pointed out to us as servants' quarters. And I was around 12 years old, and I was like, you mean the slave, where the slaves lived? And I was corrected by the, the guide, the docent. Um, she said, no, servants' quarters. Um, my daughter, when my daughter was in the Black Student Union at Santa Cruz High School, um, she and her um, classmates were supposed to take a trip to Louisiana where they were going to visit a plant. And apparently, I don't know if it's the same plantation I visited as a kid, but again, it sounded like um, the, the plantation or the tour, the experience of visiting it had been radically transformed, like since my youth. Um, and um, this was about the, the tour would have um, acknowledged slavery and, and the lives of the enslaved people on the plantation. Unfortunately, this trip was canceled due to COVID. So my daughter didn't get to go. But again, these are the kinds of things that um, uh, I think some young people are uh, lucky to be exposed to. Okay, Stacy would like to know what new monuments would you like to see in Santa Cruz County? It's for both of you. You want to answer first, Kate? It's a great question. And um, I mean, I guess I've, it's a bit of a dodge, but I'm, I'm pleased to see things that have happened just so recently. I mean, the gate to mark um, where the former um, kind of site of settlement by Chinese immigrants and sites of violence in Santa Cruz has been, um, has been memorialized with a structure inviting people to think about that. Um, and 
despite having lived in Santa Cruz for over a decade, I still find myself um, lacking, I feel like, in my understanding of the history of this place. And so I guess I can only say that I think that points to there being a wide field for that. But I think some of the questions you all, I mean, the, that you, Rebecca, and Kat have raised about what can happen in the spaces at and around missions um, seem like a really open field for, um, for exploration and creativity that could, could really invite people into a deeper investigation of the history of this region that, that precedes that, those missions, as well as reckoning with, with what happened in those spaces. Um, so that's my short non-answer. So I'll just um, concur with Professor Jones again, but I'll add that I think that um, it's possible, for example, to, to acknowledge um, the, the settler colonials, the immigrants, um, at, the, at the same time without um, uh, ignoring or um, glossing over um, uh, histories of, of displacement of native Californians. Um, doing both, I think that's that's the that's the tricky part. Um, and I think this is where the Sleepy Lagoon Memorial is, is a, a useful example. Um, but I would like to learn more about like the the Portuguese and the Italian um, uh, immigrants who who also um, came to this region. And and those communities have uh, you know real personal investment in. That in being represented here, right? Uh, their families have been here in some cases over a hundred years, and they feel very much that Santa Cruz is more than their home. It's like, you know, it's where so much, so many of their family memories are, and they also helped uh, create the city. And so, that's that is an interesting conversation, right? Because when I first came to Santa Cruz, that was. Those were some of the people that I met through um, attending church and talking to them, right? Because they're not they're not necessarily affiliated with the university. They're just folks that live in town, and they do ask that question. You know, why, when, um, how can we see Santa Cruz appreciate? right, the, the diverse history of the city. I think that, you know, um, that's a really good question. I think that is the question at hand, right? Is it possible to have an all-inclusive representation um, where people feel that their contributions to a place are honored and valued? Um, and certainly, um, you know, also reckoning with the fact that there were people indigenous to the land and how you can incorporate that into it as well because you know one of the things that I talk about a lot when I'm I'm educating about American Indians is that there's no one context story right many different Europeans came to different parts of the United States and engaged with very diverse groups of people tribes are very different from one another and the way that they uh, interacted with each other is unique in every part of the country and so um, I think for me personally, as somebody who uh, wants folks to understand ind indigeneity in the United States better, is to, is to educate about that, the diversity of the indigenous people and who they encountered first, right? Because uh, in the state of New Mexico where my tribe is located, it was the Spanish for over 200 years before the American period. And people are very confused about why there's such an influence uh, of um, that culture in that place without appreciating that long before the American period, we were already right engaging with Spanish and, and Spanish have been there, uh, Spanish Americans, right, who identify as Spanish Americans have been there for a long time. So, so there's a lot of uh, negotiating in these kinds of conversations, right? Uh, so Karen is asking about the land back movement and seeking to restore lands to indigenous people as a form of commemorative ju uh, justice. Do either of you want to comment on that? I just think that um, I, any conversation about reparations, I think, needs to include, include land, the land back movement as like a serious topic of consideration. 
Yeah, I think I I echo what Dr. Ramirez is saying, and I, I think I, I guess I'll also speak to the in that kind of thinking outside of the California context, but in a place like Virginia, I mean, there's um, in addition to the need for the restoration of lands that were seized. There's also a long history of the complex relationship between the kind of system of racial hierarchies that are constructed legally through systems of Jim Crow segregation, the impact they had on indigenous nations in the Southeast um, and the process of getting recognition by nations in places like Virginia was really impeded by the history of Jim Crow. So, so this idea that the process of reparations um, has implications across groups and with, um, is I think absolutely right. And so I don't think we can pursue one path of that uh, discussion without considering the fuller um, potential of that, that process. Um, so I think that's absolutely correct. Mm. So this, uh, this might be the, the last question, um, but uh, uh, David asks about the bell being removed from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, it was a mission bell um, and it was part of a, a system of uh, bells that were um, in various sites throughout the state that uh, acknowledged right the um, particular road or trail that's escaping me. I'm not remembering the name of it. Do you, Kat, remember? I'm. Um, the El Camino Real. Yes, yes. The Royal. The Royal. Yes, and so um, it was removed from campus, but they they still exist all over the state, and uh, we have one in downtown Santa Cruz here. So, um, so he was asking, you know, uh, if you had any comment about that or. Um, curious to know yeah so yeah so the the mission bells um uh they mark the um the road you know connecting the missions um from san diego i guess all the way to sonoma um now as far as i know about the bell at uc santa cruz so so the the bell itself is not um uh, it, like an 18th century artifact. It was um, uh, given to the university by um, a women's organization. I don't know when exactly. I don't see um, the removal of the bell as the same thing as um, raising a mission or vandalizing a mission. I think that, I mean, I, I said what I said in my, in my presentation that I think the missions are actually um, valuable troves of, of um, materials of um, native California labor and life. I think that the missions actually um, need to be protected. And I'm with uh, Professor Chavez, I think we need more uh, native curators. There's only one out of 21, um, but the bells are, I think it's important to, to distinguish the bells as these, um, us, these objects that arrived later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I certainly agree with the point that, I mean, I think part of what's so beautiful about your talk, Professor Ramirez, is the, the, the complexity of the missions as sites and the way meaning is produced in those spaces by the different populations who have occupied them, who created them. So that the idea that, that, that those spaces in their complexity have to be preserved and protected, I think makes a lot of sense to me. But as far as I, I know, the erection of those, um, the bells marking the Camino Real was one of those early 20th century um, attempts to kind of produce a certain narrative about the history of the space that was linked to uh, a vision of what California's future would be. And so I think I'm, I'm curious about the timing that um, it, it's kind of at the same time that these, this kind of great upsurge in memorialization of the Confederacy is happening. So I think there's also something going on in the early 20th century um, that is about what, uh, the resonance of these kinds of acts of public memorialization as acts of civic creation and kind of gathering of influence that I think there's probably a lot more to know there, but I think your point about drawing a distinction between historically significant spaces um, and attempts to kind of um, produce a certain narrative about them through monuments that are added on, I think is a really worthwhile thing for people to explore. And not that it tells you exactly what the kind of course of action should be, but that there is an important distinction there when we think about when is removal the right course of action? When is some other thing like 
changing who's involved in the interpretation, changing the interpretive materials around something. Um, I think, but it, it points to a series of questions that are right to ask about, you know, when is this being brought into the fore and why and by whom? And once we know the answers to those questions, we can engage in the, the larger question of what we want to do with that in this present. Um, and, and so that's, I mean, clearly, uh, as a historian, I always think knowing more about the history is going to help us um, think about what's the right course of action in, in the present. Yeah, very true. Well, uh, thank you both so much for this great conversation today. Uh, as we close out the final RCA event for the Memory Studies of the Americas series. It was my pleasure to be here with you both. And thanks to the audience as well for joining us and being on the call. And uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.